more miserable than the line at the post office. It's perpetually understaffed. It's colorless. It's packed. It can be smelly. And now it's noisy with the advent of cell phones. Last Thursday, the post office wasn't the last place I wanted to be, but it certainly made the list. Now this was two Thursdays ago. It was, you know, one of those sultry afternoons, uh, steamy, and the post office, well, was what you expect. And I was in line, my rear end was up against the double glass doors, that's how packed it was. And if that's not bad enough, there was a woman at the only clerk's, only clerk, the window with the only clerk, haggling with him about sending a package to Jakarta. It was her third post office in a row that day, she claimed. And I thought, what did she think? That at 78212, we're running a special on packages being posted to Indonesia? <laughs> anyway, after 10 more minutes or so, she got frustrated and she, she stormed out the door, taking her package, and over her shoulder she says, I'm going to Perrin Vital, where I can get some service. And I said, oh, good luck, you know. <laughs> and then, by that measure of grace, we stepped up about, you know, 13 centimeters. Well, I was just relaxing into hearing everyone's cell conversations. I know you've experienced this. One person was talking about her sister's divorce. I really wanted to hear about that. Another was talking about over-the-counter irregularity remedies you can buy at HEB, uh, you know. And a third one was talking about a dog that was terrorizing the neighborhood. I mean, you know, I wanted to hear them all. So, you know, I'm listening to them going, oh, I'm going nuts. And if that couldn't, if that wasn't bad enough, I felt myself being pushed along when a woman opened the double doors of, of, of the uh, lobby and she said, she said to the whole group, she said, I have been burglarized and the only thing I still have is what I have on my body. And I believed her. <laughs> and and I, I didn't, I, you know, I, was, I didn't know exactly what to say. You know how you're in that, maybe you don't know this, but I was in a Patrick Grumpy mood, okay? Uh, and so, uh, and I, I was trying to say something nice. The words would not come when a black guy comes in. A black dude comes in right behind her, and he hears her speech. He has you know, blue jeans that have, have some holes in them. He's got worn out work boots and he's got, he's got all sorts of dust over him, all over him from a construction site. So he's been laboring all day. He, he hears what the woman said and he looks at her so sweetly. I mean, he just looks at her so sweetly and he says, ma'am, I, I want you to know that I, I know where you can go to, to, to get the stuff you need. I, I know the places you can go to get back on your feet. And with that, he walked around the line. You know, if you go to 78212, you've got that table that's adjacent to the long line. He goes over to the table. He takes an express mail label. He turns it over, and he begins writing out a careful list with his carpenter's pencil, that little square pencil. He begins writing a careful list of all the places that will help this lady. And midway in the list, he put Christ Episcopal Church. Well, she takes the list from him. She takes the list from him. She doesn't really look at the list, but she looks at him. And I could tell that what meant something to her was how tender he was with her and how attentive. I mean, that's, that's what she needed. At that, at that time, and then she announced to the whole group, by the way, the three people are still on their cell phones, um, but, um, but then she announced to the whole group of us, she says, I, I know that I no longer think straight. She says, I know I have the beginnings of a little dementia. She says, but sir, I really thank you for listening to me. Wow. And with that, that he, he comforted her and he, well, shamed me because it was apparent to me the Lord had sent the black man with the ripped dungarees and the worn out boots and the dust all over him 
to be with this woman. It was apparent. It may remember, made me remember of, um, uh, when I was in the military, we had a chaplain to our battalion, the, first, the 41st Infantry, who went on two deployments with us. He was an older guy, a nice fellow though, but he'd always say to us, he said, boys, he said, the Lord will send you a thousand miles to speak to one person. He'll send you a thousand miles to speak to just one person. And when you get there, he'll equip you to do it. And in that steamy post office, I really believed it. I believed what the chaplain had said to me so long ago. Well, Samuel doesn't have to go a thousand miles, but he does have to travel 31 miles on foot uh, to get from Shiloh, where that's his headquarters, um, uh, north of Jerusalem, and to go all the way to Bethlehem. Uh, the story opens, a great story in 1 Samuel 16. The Lord says to Samuel, Samuel being a very important person in the Bible, you know, he's the bridge guy. He's the last of the judges and the first of the prophets. So, you know, he is, he is really important. He looms, he looms large in the Old Testament. The, the Lord says to, to Samuel, quit grieving over King Saul. I have rejected him as king over Israel. I've rejected him. And I'm going to send you to Bethlehem, uh, to the house of Jesse, uh, the Bethlehemite, to anoint a new king. Well, Samuel's pretty tough. But he realizes that there is a king on the throne already. If he starts making noise that he's going to anoint a new king, this is always bad for your health, okay? He says, you know, if I, if I do that, boss, I, I, Saul will kill me. And the Lord says, no, no, I got that figured out already in advance. He said, take two heifers with you and say, when you get to Bethlehem, I'm here to do a sacrifice for the Lord. Don't tell me the Lord's not conniving, Okay. I mean, that's the slyest move ever. You know, take some heifers as camouflage. So, so he does what the Lord says. It's always best to do that. And um, he, he goes to Bethlehem. And sure enough, I mean, look, people are really feeling the effects of Saul's inconsistencies. Um, and, um, and so he gets outside the, the city and the city fathers come out and say, uh, Sam, did you come here? peacefully or not and he says no no i just came here to sacrifice can't you see i got the heifers right here and so they allow him to go on into the city he knocks on jesse's door and he says i have come here to do a sacrifice for the lord and have a festival he says so you go sanctify yourself and your, you and your, your family go sanctify yourselves that's a very polite way to say go bathe we can stand each other at dinner okay <laughs> I wonder how that would work with your, with your children. You know, go sanctify yourself. <laughs> you know, the new try anyway. But anyway, so they do that. And, uh, and so they, they, they hadn't eaten dinner yet. This is all preamble. And um, suddenly Eliab, Eliab, one of Jesse's sons, walks in front of Samuel. And he looks like David Robinson. Okay? We're talking head and shoulders above everybody else. You know, sleek, strong. And... You know, Samuel would have remembered, if you read the 10th chapter of 1 Samuel, uh, how Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else. So this is reminiscent. And, and so Sam says, all right, Lord, search is over. We got the guy. Okay, we got the guy. I need to pour the oil on him right now. And the Lord says, no, I have not chosen him. I've rejected him. He says, and by the way, Sam, he says, you know, when, when you look at people, you see the outside. But when I look at people, I see the heart. So keep looking, okay? Well, then comes Abinadab, and then Shammah, and then three others. They all look like they could play outside linebacker for the Cowboys, okay? They are magnificent men, magnificent. I know you didn't think the Cowboys were playing then, but um, anyway. But, um, but they're magnificent, and the Lord says, I rejected them all. And finally, you know, Samuel is getting a little... A little antsy says he turns to Jesse he says you got any more kids and 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 Jesse says well the, the runt is outside uh, taking care of the sheep he says well bring him in he says and this is a good ploy too he says we're not eating until you bring him in okay so no barbecue until he gets in here and so David comes in 
And as soon as Samuel sees him, he realizes how beautiful he is. He's not just, he's not just a sturdy looking young man. He's beautiful. And the Lord says, he's the one. Anoint him. And so Samuel anoints him and returns home. It's really a great story, don't you think? And by the way, if you've always kind of pushed the Old Testament aside, thinking you, it's just too confusing, a good place to start is with 1 Samuel. Um, it's often been compared to, uh, to the Odyssey and to the Aeneid. It's that beautifully written. And so it's a good place to start if you want to start reading the Old Testament. 1 Samuel is beautiful. So anyway, um, Samuel returns home. David has been anointed. Well, there, I, I, was con I was thinking about this, um, this story all week, and we can glean a few, a, a few lessons from it that I think we need as we hit the last sprint of Lent. One is we need to remember that God does the choosing. God does the choosing. And, you know, we do, you know, we make a big deal out of your spiritual gifts and find out what they are and, you know, and all that. But the truth is, the Lord chooses who he wishes. And he will send you and me to do what, we, what he wants us to do. And I can promise you that every one of us is being, is being chosen. I can't promise you that. We've all been chosen. And you'll be chosen again and again to mainly do things that no one else will ever see. But you'll be chosen. It's the Lord who does the choosing. And the benefit to that is it has nothing to do with how hot we think we are. You know, how smart we think we are. It's all about the Lord. He chooses. What does he say in the 15th chapter of John? You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I chose you and anointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. I chose you to do what I have you to do so that you will bear fruit into that engagement. Fruit that will continue to last. There's no fly-by-night choosing here. But God does the choosing. And he will equip you. He will equip you and me to do what we're supposed to do. But if he's faithful to choose us, he's sure enough, sure enough giving us what we need to do. It. You know, I... Um, uh, and um, you may remember in the next chapter of uh, 1 Samuel 17, here's David. He's still just a boy. No one's paying any attention to him. Uh, and he has such a heart for God. He hears that the Philistines are just whooping up on Israel, just whooping them. And you can tell them from Alabama, can't you? But um, anyway, so he goes down with lunches supposedly for his brothers, and he doesn't like what he sees. He says, he tells King Saul, he says, I can take on that giant Goliath. I can take him on. And so in one of the most comical scenes in the whole Old Testament, Saul tries to put, put the, his armor on, Dave, on David. And he, of course, just hangs on him. He can't even move. And, and David says, I don't need that. I have the armor of God. I don't need your armor. I need only the armor of God. And he goes and he defeats and he goes and defeats Goliath, the one they thought was undefeatable, the one that was unassailable. David takes him down like a big oak. He has on the armor of God. It's the armor of God. And what is the armor of God? The armor of God is love. Okay? The armor of God is love. Now, I'm not being frilly and frou-frou here. You can have all sorts of gifts, okay? You can have a son, you can be... You can be a prophet, you can be a teacher, you can be a, you can be a pastor, you can have all those things. But foundationally, if there's no love, you cannot be a vessel worthy to be called by God. You know, I think somebody said something snappy at some point. If I don't have love, I'm just a clanging bell. You know, something like that. But love is foundational for everything we do. And in fact, you know, it's key if you pay attention to the story of Jesus... Just before he's arrested, the last act he takes with others before he's arrested is that he gets on his knees and he washes the feet of his disciples. And he says to me, he says, you call me your Lord and teacher because that's who I am. But if I, your Lord and teacher, have knelt down and washed your feet, you should be washing each other's feet. A new commandment I give to you that you must love one another as I have loved you. Now pay attention to how this works. This is very important. You cannot manufacture love on your, on, uh, on your own. 
okay? You, you have a lot of neat attributes, but you can't make love. You cannot manufacture it. The Lord gives us what we need, doesn't he? He will give us the love we need. And you know, as the story goes on, what does Jesus do? After he washes the feet, he goes and prays at Gethsemane. He is arrested and he is sent to the cross. On the cross, when Christ, when Christ sacrifices himself out of ultimate love for you and me, people unworthy of such love, when he dies that way, he lets loose the power of his love on every one of us. That's why Lent's important. That's why it's important. His love flows from the cross to you and me. And now our job is to share it when we're called. When we're called. The 12th chapter, I think, of St. Luke, it says, Be like a servant waiting for your master. So when he knocks on the door, you'll get up and open the door for him. I love that scripture. Be like a servant who's waiting on his master to come. That's the, that's the posture of those who, who believe we're being called. Be like a servant waiting on your master so that when he knocks on the door, you'll hop up and open the door and say, what's next, boss? That's our posture. That's our place. God does the calling. We do the answering. God does the loving, we do the receiving, and then we can share what he's given us. Oh, did I run into that this week? Woohoo, Lord, last Sunday, okay, typical Patrick Gahan, Sunday morning, 9 o'clock. Scott said, listen, we got to be ready for visitors and so forth, so, you know, I'm out there doing what he's told me to do. I'm running up and down the sidewalk, you know, and one of my running buddies shows up, you know, one of my buddies, and uh, he's walking up the sidewalk. And he says, Pat, I got to tell you, I got to tell you what happened to me uh, this week. And I said, you know, it's going to it's gonna have to wait, man. Can't you see I'm busy? You know, and he goes and sits down. But I could tell with the look in his eye, I need to pay attention. So once I kind of got situated, I came and sat down right about where Larry and Liz O'Neill are. I sat right next to him. And I said, okay, what you, what you got to tell me? And he goes, he goes, Pat, you know, I, I did it. He said, I said, you know, he says, I, I, I've, been, I, I've been irreconciled from this person in my family for a long time. And, the, and I suddenly I had no place to hide. And so I just reached out to her. I just reached out to her. And she agreed to, to meet with me. And so we met. And it was a miracle. It was a miracle. You know, we've been restored. And so I'm over here doing the preacher thing. I'm going, boy, that is really something. I said, to him, I said, I really want to commend you for that. <clears throat> then he looked over there at me. He goes, Pat, I didn't tell you that for me. I told you that for you. And I went home. And before I sat down for lunch, I made a phone call. 